In this video, I'd like to give a quick explanation of Shakespeare's Sonnet 115. And my primary purpose in doing this is not only because the sonnet is interesting, but because it really is a pair with Sonnet 116. And that one is frequently studied, but people tend to ignore that these sonnets go together. And I think it's really fascinating to read them uh, in tandem with each other. Now, before we jump into this, I do want to point out that in the original text, which you can find online, and I'll show you how to do that at the end of this uh, video, in the original text, uh, some of the punctuation is different, uh, some of the spelling is different, and most of the time this doesn't really matter. But in this poem, there are two places where I do think it is critical to know what the original looked like. And so if we look at line eight, for instance, of this sonnet, you will notice that I've added an S in square brackets here. Uh, in the original, we do not have this S. So that's the 1609 quarto edition. And uh, editors sometimes supply the S to try to make sense of the grammar. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Perhaps more important is the very end of the poem. And a lot of editors tend to add a question mark at the end. So perhaps we should add a question mark at the very end of this poem, but I have left it as is, as a period, uh, because it's a bit ambiguous whether it's a question or not. And that definitely changes the way we read this. As you can see from the right side of the screen here, I've picked out a few images that I think go with this poem. And the four dominant images in the poem are the flame in the first quatrain, a quatrain is four lines of poetry, okay? Uh, or four lines of poetry in a sonnet specifically. The image of time, uh, time that ticks away and that changes things. Then we have the image of ruling of a king with a crown, uh, and time is, is compared to a tyrant in this case. And finally, I know it's not a great picture, but we have the, the image of a babe, of an infant. Uh, and so that's the final kind of metaphor that's being used in this sonnet. Well, let's go through this now and see if we can make some sense of the specific lines. So sonnet 115 starts with, those lines that I before have writ do lie. And by lines here, Shakespeare means those poems specifically. All of the sonnets up to now, they're all a bunch of lies. <laughs> and this comes as a, as a surprise. Uh, so let's figure out why he says this. Even those that said, I could not love you dear, yet then, so then is back then, my judgment, my intellect, my reason, knew no reason why my most full flame should afterwards burn clear. And if we think about the idea of a flame here, we can really talk about it in, in two ways. We can talk about it in terms of intensity. So how bright is the flame? How intense is it? How hot is it? And then also we can think of it in terms of size. And the lines seem to suggest almost that these two things are easily confused or misunderstood. So if we think about a full flame, for instance, uh, a full flame seems to refer more to size than to intensity. But if we think about clear, perhaps that refers more to intensity, right? How brightly is the flame burning? Is there smoke? Uh, is it, can you see through it? So that's the clarity, the intensity of the flame. And what he's really saying here then is that in the past, he's written lots of sonnets and he kept saying, well, I love you, I love you, I love you. Uh, I can't love you any more than this. But now he says, well, wait a second. Maybe I could love you more, or the intensity could, you know, change. So perhaps all of those sonnets then, those expressions of love, were really a bunch of lies. Okay. So let's go to the next four lines then, the next quatrain. And here he talks about time. Now, these four lines are very tricky. And part of it, part of the problem is that we have all these verbs here. So we have creep, change, tan, blunt, and divert. But what is doing the action of these verbs? Is it time or is it accidents? So let's see if we can figure this out here. Accidents are events, and these are the things that happen over time. The word accident literally means something that befalls, something that happens. The word millioned here means numerous, so we have numerous events over time, 
And reckoning means counting, judging, that, that sense of time. Well, in the first bit, we have creep in twixt vows and change decrees of kings. And most people agree that this definitely refers to these accidents. So over time, there are lots of events that creep in twixt. That means betwixt. The first bit is gone here. Between. So between vows. And imagine that, for instance, you make a vow to somebody. You say, I'm going to love you forever and ever. And then, you know, the other person get sick right and that's an event that happens that's an accident and then you say if you're a mean person <laughs> you say ah I don't think I'm gonna keep loving you it's just too much work well in that case uh, heaven forbid it happens you would say the the, the, uh, the accidents the events have crept in between the vows right and the same thing can happen to the laws or decrees of kings the king makes a law Circumstances change and the king says, well, maybe we need to fix the law. We need to adapt it to new, uh, new times. So this part here, we could say then that whose million accidents creep in twixt vows and change decrees of kings. We could say that this bit just ends here and that maybe the next verbs go back to time. But there is a problem with this because as you can see here, accidents is plural time is singular right so time is singular but the verb doesn't match up it should be time tans sacred beauty or blunts or diverts and that is where that that is why so many editors um, are tempted to put this s here because what we could say then is that all of this all the way to the end here refers to accidents and then this goes back to time and I do think that makes a kind of sense, but you should be aware that we don't have that in the original. And it is possible that already with tan, we are going back to time. And that Shakespeare has simply used um, the singular, uh, sorry, the plural form of the verb here, tan instead of tans, uh, in order to match it with time, which, is seem which seems a little bit odd to us. Okay, so hopefully that's not too confusing. But what I would suggest is you, you do follow this, this um, insertion of the S, put the brackets here, and I think it does make a certain amount of sense. What we're saying then is that all of these events come in, they tan sacred beauty, they blunt the sharpest intentions, you have great intentions, but they become dull over time, you gain a tan, uh, you gain a tan and, and your white beauty is gone. Um, and as a result of all of these things, time, right, diverts the strongest minds even to the course of altering things. By course here, we mean like the course of a river. So if a river is changing course, if it's going in different directions, then it's not going straight like time is, uh, but it's dealing with alteration. It's dealing with change as things alter the course changes and so perhaps time also diverts like you do with a river right it, or, or with a dam you divert a stream um, you, you divert strong minds from their original intentions as they adapt to altering things so the mind becomes more like a wandering stream rather than a straight line all right now that's a lot of explanation of the second quatrain let's see if we can make sense of the third section here now so here the poet says alas which means oh no uh, or it's too bad really so alas why fearing of time's tyranny might i not then say now i love you best when i was certain or in certainty crowning the present doubting of the rest if we think of time as personified, and some editors capitalize time as a, as a result, so if time is personified and is like a king, then time is constantly in charge. Time is making us change our best intentions, as we've just seen. So the, the king time comes by and says, nope, you cannot love this person anymore. We want you to love somebody else, that kind of thing. So if you're afraid of what time might do, then perhaps you might say in the moment, now I love you best, right? You say to your beloved and you say, well, I have no idea what the future is going to bring. I'm afraid of time. And 
I still love you. I, I love you best right now, and that's the best that I can say. So at the end here, then he says, we crown the present. So we think of this as the present or the now moment. And we don't know what the future is going to bring. All of this is uncertain. Okay. Then we're just going to focus on this moment. We're going to crown the present. And that way we can take the crown away from time, the tyrant time, and we give it to somebody else. So there's, there's a reference here to deposing the king, uh, which seems quite rebellious in this circumstance. This line here is a little tricky where he refers to being certain or uncertainty. Uh, and if you think of or or over as, well, it could be literally over, right? If you think of being certain about the now moment over the uncertainty, the uncertainty of time, uh, you, you could read this literally. But I think it's better to think of it loosely as, as something like um, in relation to uncertainty. So I was certain in relation to uncertainty, which can then be interpreted in different ways. You could say, well, I was certain despite uncertainty, or I was certain about uncertainty. There's definitely different ways to read this particular word. Uh, if you read it as being about uncertainty, then you would say, well, I'm completely certain that life is uncertain, <laughs> if that makes any sense. And so the best I can do, given this uncertainty that I'm certain about, is to crown a present and just to live in the here and now. <laughs> uh, if you read it more loosely to kind of say, well, I'm certain uh, in relation to uncertainty or despite uncertainty, then you're kind of ignoring the uncertainty and you're just focusing on being certain for the time present. As you can see, this is a very difficult poem, uh, which has given people lots of trouble. But it is interesting, and so if we try to summarize this quatrain now, we could say that he's saying, Alas, if I'm afraid of what time can do, then maybe the best response is to say, At the moment, I love you the best. This is the brightest my flame can burn. Uh, and maybe that was okay back in the day when I was certain about or certain in relation to uncertainty, that I doubted the rest, the, the, the rest of time, what might happen in the future, and I simply focused on the, the time present and I crowned that particular moment. Right? Maybe that was a good response. Now, before we look at the, rhyme, the last couplet here, the, the rhyming couplet at the end, um, we should think back to the beginning for a moment, because at the very beginning he said, those lines that I before have writ do lie. And that seemed very certain, which is ironic, right, given this language of certainty. <laughs> but if we now look at this quatrain, it's almost like he's actually changed his mind. He's going back and he's saying, well, maybe they were lies, but that's the best I could do. I didn't know what the future was going to bring, and so maybe it wasn't so bad. Maybe it wasn't a terrible lie. What's remarkable about this sonnet is that this sonnet actually seems to change. It changes course. It, it uh, starts out by, with, with quite a strong claim, and then it seems to undercut that claim over time, which is actually very appropriate in terms of what this sonnet is about. So let's go to the last two lines now. And I would say these are actually the most difficult lines of the sonnet, uh, if you can believe it. So here the poet says, love is a babe. So love is an infant, right? Love is going to grow up over time. Uh, when you fall in love with somebody, it's not a perfect relationship right away. You have to work out the kinks. It's going to take quite a bit of time. And the intensity of your love will change. Love is a babe, then might I not say so, to give full growth to that which still doth grow. Is this a question or is it a statement? Let's, let's look at both of these options. If you say that this is a statement, and there's no question mark here, then you might interpret this as really being focused on the not. So you would say, if you think back to this, might I not then say, you would say, then as a result, right, this is like therefore, I'll give you the symbol here. Therefore, I might not say so. I should never have said I love you best. It was a total mistake. I, I couldn't have said that because love is growing. And so the conclusion here is then I might not have said that. I shouldn't have said that. 
if I wanted to give full growth to that which still doth grow, right? If my flame is going to burn more brightly, I really shouldn't be saying this kind of stuff. I love you the best right now because I need to give full growth to that which still is growing. Okay, seems to make a kind of sense. But a lot of readers are not entirely satisfied with this. Um, why would he first kind of go back in time and, and, and justify himself and then change his mind again? <laughs> that seems very odd. So it's hard to know quite what to make of this. So perhaps it is better to think of it as a question. And if you read it as a question, then the question goes something like this. If, since love is an infant and, and, and is growing, right, then might I not have said in the past, think of this as really saying this in the past, although you could even say it today, uh, now I love you best, because at the time I was giving full growth, right, that's as, as fully grown as it was at the time, but the infant is still growing as well. So if we think about stages along the way, then we can say each stage along the way is as fully grown as we can imagine it up to that point. And then the next stage is as fully grown and so on. Um, so that's another way to read this, to kind of say, well, I want to admit that this is as, as great as it is at the moment, even though it's possible that this is still growing as well. So perhaps this is more of a question then. Maybe we're saying, well, maybe we should say this when we're in the moment because that's, the, that's really the best we can do. As you can probably hear, this is even difficult for me to explain because the, the, there's so much ambiguity to these lines. Uh, it's not an easy sonnet and we shouldn't simplify it too much. I, I can certainly imagine that you can come up with other readings of these last two lines that make equal sense as well. So really don't be shy about that. But hopefully at the very least you've seen that this is an interesting sonnet with some fascinating metaphors. Uh, that when we look at the original, we see that the punctuation, uh, the, the grammar sometimes is different, which presents certain interesting problems. Uh, and as you go on to Sonnet 116, you'll be able to compare the two and really learn a lot in terms of how Shakespeare often writes these pairs of poems uh, in order to give us different perspectives on the same issue. As I mentioned before, you can find all of Shakespeare's sonnets online. And you might want to check this out. If you go to the British Library, you can find a digitized copy of the first quarto edition from 1609. And uh, it really is quite interesting to see what the text looked like at that point. So you can see we have Sonnet 115 here. And as we talked about, there's no S after diverts. If we go to the next page, you can see also there's no question at the end. Notice as well that Sonnet 116 is misprinted as 119, 119 by accident, which is kind of humorous. And uh, I'll let you check out the rest of this manuscript yourself. But it is really cool to be able to travel back in time like this without necessarily setting foot in the British Library.